Good evening, everybody. Uh, tonight is we have a short itinerary, I think, but we're going to start things off with a public comment session, uh, like we're going to do for every planning board meeting from uh, for future meetings. So, is there anybody here tonight that has anything to say that uh, is not specifically in regard to the hearing uh, that we have uh, tonight in front of us for Coca-Cola? Yes, okay. Um, so I'd ask if you could come up, state your name and your address. And you've got about three minutes to talk about whatever you want to talk about. And this isn't, a, it's not an interaction thing. It's just to say your piece and, and, um, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Janet Gross, 38 Round Hill Road. I actually expected more neighbors here tonight. Um, I would just like to say that there has been concern expressed by um, Round Hill neighbors and others about the um, sustainability plan. And um, there seems to be a consensus that it might be a good idea to take another look at it. Um, apparently the plan was approved five years ago and um, it might be a good idea to take another look at it. As I think about the plan, and I haven't read it recently, I read it several years ago in haste, I've often wondered, well, this is all predicated on infinite usage of fossil fuels. And it's interesting that there was recently an op-ed in the New York Times, um, the title of which um, was Life After Oil and Gas. And I think it's something that needs to be thought about. There was also a recent op-ed a few days ago by Robert Stern, who is Dean of Yale Architecture School. And he argued that although he is a proponent of density, density does have its limitations. And he was looking at a new proposal to develop the area around Grand Central Station and he argues that um, we don't need 1,300 foot skyscrapers. New York doesn't need to look like every other huge big city. And that the old neighborhoods, the old buildings, maybe repurpose them, but they are certainly worth preserving. I think people are now making arguments of the, very, of the importance of green space and uh, you know that is a fine line with density. And so I am just here to say that I think it's important to look at that plan again, that there are people who've moved into uh, Northampton who are not aware of the plan, who are not aware of the implications of the plan. And um, I just urge you to have some public sessions where you take another look at it. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone else from the public <coughs> has something to say other than about anything other than the Coca-Cola issue? No? Okay, then let's jump right into, uh, I'm sorry, did you have something? No? Okay. Oh, we should note, yes, there was um, a note from uh, Heidi Rose, uh, Hedy, sorry. Uh, to the planning board, should I read the whole thing? Or, yeah. That's, that will be submitted for the record tonight, um, and this will be posted for now. Um, we'll put it, you can put it in the minutes. Yeah, okay, so it'll be referenced in the minutes. It's regarding zoning changes and so forth. Okay, let's jump into our first and only uh, hearing that's scheduled for tonight, scheduled for seven o'clock uh, site plan for the treatment system at Coca-Cola 45 Industrial Drive, Northampton map ID 25A-185. And there's a presentation. Just introduce myself to start. My name is Brent Sutter with Woodard and Curran. I am Coca-Cola's consultant on this project. 
The, uh, the project is the, uh, we call it the Wastewater Treatment System Modifications Project. We are uh, modifying the existing wastewater treatment system at the Coca-Cola facility located at 45 um, Industrial Drive in Northampton. Got a short uh, set of slides here that will run us through some of the key civil drawings that shows some of the uh, components of the overall project as far as location on site of the, the new treatment building and some uh, associated storage tanks. Um, so I will uh, jump to the next slide here. Uh, this um, map here is the site locus. It just shows the approximate lo or the location of the site. Um, so we're in this this area here. I think everybody knows where the facility is within the industrial park. Um, this next drawing shows the existing site plan uh, on the uh, the northern, excuse me, the northwestern side of the building. Yes. Can you turn the lights off out because we really can't see it from here? Appreciate it. This uh, drawing here shows one small area of the site. The, uh, the project actually, um, there's two work areas on the site. This is one of them. There's another at the rear of the facility where a uh, trailer parking area is going to be constructed. But I'll start here at this location. Again, this is showing the sort of existing conditions uh, at a portion of the site where the new treatment building and tanks will be located. Uh, the next drawing shows the, uh, the proposed building, which is this structure here, approximately 2,300 square feet, 30 feet wide by 76 feet long. It is a uh, pre-engineered metal building, metal frame building, metal siding, metal roof with a uh, single sloped roof. It's about 20 feet high on this side. On the other side is 17 and a half feet high. Uh, outside of the building, we have several storage tanks. The largest one here is 300,000 gallons, which will uh, store wastewater prior to treatment. There's a smaller tank here that's about 76,000 gallons, that, uh, which is where the, uh, the actual biological treatment will take place. And there's a smaller tank here that's 25,000 gallons, whereas, which is where sludge that's produced from the treatment process will be stored prior to being dewatered and hauled off site for disposal. There is some uh, modifications to the um, existing employee parking area. There's a uh, landscaped island that will be demolished in this area and will be uh, rebuilt further over to the side to allow for this uh, driveway area that is about 24 feet wide. There's some new paving there. There's a new 20,000 gallon tank in this location here that's directly adjacent to the existing uh, plant building. They'll be used for the temporary storage of off-spec product, which is simply uh, <clears throat> the product that they manufacture that's not able to be bottled for whatever reason. There are times when um, it has to be removed from the site uh, as a result of it being off spec, so to speak. So there needs to be a place for that to be temporarily stored before it can be hauled off site, and that is going to be the location for that. I think I'll jump to the next drawing. This shows a grading plan and underground utilities that are associated with uh, this project. 
obviously it's hard to see, but we do have, uh, there's an underground pipe from this off-spec product tank that will allow us to convey that. Uh, if it's not hauled off site, we have an alternative means of dealing with it, which is conveying it through this underground pipe to a manhole that eventually um, gets conveyed to the treatment system here or the existing treatment system over here where it can be biologically treated. Uh, again, uh, hauling it off site is, is another option, so they have multiple options to deal with that product. The, uh, in the wastewater treatment building here, there is underground piping required to get wastewater to the building and back to the city POTW system. There's several underground pipes here that tie into existing pipes that bring wastewater into and out of the building. Uh, there's above ground pipes that go between the building and, and these various tanks. There is here is uh, stormwater manholes and storm drain lines that are being relocated. They were over in this area underneath the tanks. We simply have to move them over to the side uh, to make room for those new tanks. <coughs> There's, uh, that's really the majority of the, the underground piping that is being installed. There is a, there is a pipe associated with some floor drains in this building that that uh, runs between these tanks and down into the existing wastewater lift station that in turn will be pumped back to the treatment system here or the existing treatment system over here. Uh, those are really the main uh, components of the wastewater modifications project in this area of the site. The next drawing that we'll look at shows the work area in the uh, rear of the facility, which is the trailer parking area. Um, the existing building is, is hard to make out on this uh, drawing, but it's, it's in this area here. Uh, behind the building in this area is currently just a grass area. Uh, the existing trailer parking area is where the new treatment building is going to be. That's an area where they drop off uh, empty trailers for a short period of time until they are able to be loaded with, with the uh, product that's being manufactured at the facility. And since the, we're losing the existing trailer parking area, we need to find a new place to locate that. And it turned out that the best place was in, at the rear of the facility in this grass area. So we, Excuse me, can you sure. tell me exactly, I, I'm having a hard time figuring out exactly where this is in, in relationship to the bike trail 91 um, yep. and, and such, because it's hard to see I where I'm sitting. I think I can go back to the site locus and maybe blow it up a little bit and give you an idea uh, of these two work areas in relation to the other features in the vicinity of the property. Um, just go back to that. And I'll do my best to blow this up a little bit so we can see it a little better. I can find where the zoom is on this. What's that? View. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so um, the first area that we looked at um, is in this area of the property here. It's, mm -hmm. it's close to the property line over on this side. The trailer parking area is at the rear of the facility, uh, somewhere in this area here. Mm -hmm. So 91 is, of it, is right here. Mm -hmm. Just to uh, put it all into perspective, any other questions about and where's that parking area, the trailer parking area exactly? 
It, it is right, um, right in this area here where my cursor is, yeah. Okay. There's a paved driveway that goes along the, yes. per, the back side of the facility, um, and it's right off from that in this location right here. Okay. And did you, you say you were going to move the trailer parking area to somewhere else? Let's, uh, excuse me. Sure. Why don't we go through the presentation and then hold okay. public comment until the presentation's done? Thanks. The, uh, tra the new trailer parking area here is um, approximately 60 feet wide by 100 feet long. That's in this rectangular area here. There's a small strip of concrete that the landing gear for the trailers will rest upon. And then the area in front of that, there's some new pavement where the trucks will back the trailers into this parking area, drop the trailers off, and then drive away. There is uh, stormwater that's going to be uh, generated from this new paved area, which is now impervious before it was grass. Uh, the stormwater will be collected through a storm scepter system, which removes grit and oil um, and conveys stormwater through these infiltration chambers where the stormwater will be infil infiltrated into the ground. Um, that is really the, the uh, overall design components of this trailer parking area is obviously the paved parking area and the stormwater collection and infiltration system. On the back side of the parking area is a guardrail. Um, obviously prevents uh, trailers from being backed into the building. The remainder of the drawings that I have are just design details that show uh, cross sections through, you know, the pavement, through the uh, stormwater infiltration system. And they're at such small detail that I'm not sure as if it's worth going through those. We, I sort of wanted to give you the feel of the main features of the design and would be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Just so you know, the DPW did issue the amended stormwater permit because it yes. was originally a stormwater permit, but um, that has been amended so you all can close the hearing. Okay. Any comments that they have? No. no. They're happy. <laughs> questions from the board? Is, there, is, it, is it higher? Is, it, is there going to be more visibility from around the surface of the area? Certainly none of the structures that are being built are taller than any of the existing structures on site. The building itself being only 20 feet is uh, shorter than the existing plant building. The tanks um, are directly adjacent to the new building are about 30 feet high. That's about the same height as their existing wastewater tanks. Um, so I, you know, the answer I guess would be no. That all that there's nothing outside of the ordinary there as far as the heights go. How did the truck trailers get back there? What I don't know your your campus. What, how did they get from? Uh, let's see. I I know you'll have to go back. Yep, not a problem. Even even verbally, just telling me about it would be fine. Uh, so the main entrance to the facility is off from Industrial Drive, which is over on this side of the property. The trucks drive in here. There's a driveway that comes around the right side of the facility and, and around the back of the facility. And there's, you know, it depends on where the trucks are going to. There are multiple loading docks. There's a loading dock over in this area, and there's one back in this area. And if the trucks need to get back to this loading dock, then they'll drive around the rear of the facility to access that. 
Um, so they'll actually be traveling less distance to get to the new facility, the new location. Yes, yes. it'll put the trailers, I guess, close closer to the one loading dock over here and maybe about the same distance as the other loading dock. But. Can you describe what the wastewater is? Sure, the, uh, the wastewater is generated as a result of, you know, manufacturing of the product that's produced at the facility, which is uh, non-carbonated beverages, juices, uh, Powerade, teas, things like that. So the wastewater contains, uh, you know, residuals of that product, which contains mostly sugar. Mm -hmm. So we're really, we're, we're, uh, we're treating sugar here via, you know, biological means, biological treatment system. Their existing tr treatment system is a biological treatment system. We're just adding additional treatment capabilities at the site. And what would happen, what would the ecological effect be if the tank breached, if there was a breach of the tank? The, um, the off-spec product tank, which can, you know, is, is meant for the temporary storage, very short-term storage of their off-spec product that has a secondary containment berm around it, so it would capture any spills that may occur uh, from that tank. The, the actual wastewater tanks, uh, beside the building, the larger ones, those do have uh, overflow piping that drains back to the wastewater collection system, which allows it to be uh, retreated. Um, if the tanks do overflow for some reason, if there's a catastrophic failure of, of the tanks themselves, then um, it would be the same as with their other wastewater tanks. It would, you know, go onto the ground and there would need to be a, a cleanup of some sort going on there of that material. But, you know, with the proper design that we've done here, the, uh, the tanks are obviously designed to hold this product and we've designed... Uh, you know, the overflow system to take into account any overflows that may occur without impact to the environment. So you don't have any uh, elevations of the building, uh, not on the drawings, but do you have anything else? To, or it's, it's just a, like a butler building, a metal building? Yes, I, I do have the rendering that I showed you at the last uh, pre-planning board meeting that I could bring up if that would be helpful. It shows an, sort of an artistic rendering of what the building and the tanks may look like. Yeah, it might just so okay. people get a feel for what. So it is, you know, uh, as you say, a typical butler style building, which is a metal steel frame building with metal siding and a metal sloped roof. Again, it's about 20 feet high on this side, 17 and a half feet on this side. The tank, the largest tank is about 30 feet high, 42 feet in diameter. So it is larger than the building. As, as you can see there, there's uh, curbing around the tank. Uh, so that is gives you a feel, hopefully, for what it will look like from one point of view, standing up beside the existing uh, plant building. And again, tell us where that point of view is let's, coming from. Let's wait for the presentation, and then we can have questions from the public. <laughs> Just write it down. <laughs> I, that was the the one rendering that we have. Okay. Um, so. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Uh, the proposal says there's no additional traffic being generated, so you're going to have to haul the sludge off site. How often does that happen? Uh, maybe about once a week. Sludge is currently generated um, associated with their existing wastewater treatment system that's located back in this area. 
Uh, there's a sludge storage tank associated with that system, and that's hauled off about once a week. So we think that the frequency will be, will be about the same, and therefore no additional truck traffic associated with the sl hauling sludge off site. And with the new system, we are dewatering it, so it reduces the volume of sludge. Um, so that will help with uh, reducing the, the volume of sludge generated and the frequency of having to remove it. Does it have any residual value? It does, yeah. Fertilizer there, or something? It does. There's a company uh, that will take it for its, uh, for its, uh, you know, it's biological in nature. It can be used to, I don't know if you want to, either of you guys want to speak on that, what it's going to be used for, but. Uh, oh, yes, there is, a, there, there is certainly beneficial use for it. Okay depending on who ends up taking it. I don't know if we've decided 100% on who will uh, be removing it from the site yet, but it certainly can have a beneficial use. Okay, why don't we open this up uh, for public comment before, I guess, Brenda, if you want to stay for a second. If you have a, a comment, pro or con, why don't you hold off? If you have a for now, if you have a question about the presentation that that Brent can answer, then maybe we'll take those first, and then and then we'll have uh, just regular uh, public comment. So, does anybody have a specific question on the presentation? Okay, if I could just get your name and address. Yes, Joanne Mackwitz. M A C K I E W I C Z 80 Crosby Street. Um, can we get this presentation um, so we can see this in detail? We, um, applicants are required to submit um, all the presentation materials and we put them on our website. So all the permit materials are accessible from our website. From Northampton? Yes. Okay. Um, another question is um, in reference to the, the cylinder and this other storage tank. Again, perspective, where was 91, where was, it's hard for mm -hmm. me to, you know. So uh, if we look at this plan here, uh, 91 is sort of back on this side, mm -hmm. uh, and the industrial drive is over on this side. Uh, so if you were standing on industrial drive, uh, you would see uh, these tanks here. Yeah. They would probably for the most part hide the building behind it since the building is not as tall uh, so that's sort of the perspective that you would see from industrial drive and where are the trip where's the parking and the trailer access uh, it, it is back t in this direction over here towards 91 I can go to the site locus plan if you would like again um, to look at that but uh, so with industrial drive over on this side, 91 on this side, the, the tanks that I was just pointing to is here, and the trailer parking area is back here. Okay. Okay. Any other questions that uh, need to be addressed by Brent? No? OK, thank you. Um, so now we'll open this up to public comment. Uh, for those who have any comments, if you could just raise your hand, I'll call on you. You can come up and just name an address, and then whatever you have to say. Does anybody want to weigh in on this? No? Okay. I have one other question. Sure. Um, it said that truck trailer um, access, the, the traveling would be a shorter distance. Could you tell me what that means exactly? Because you're entering from Industrial Drive, mm -hmm. you're coming around, and you're you're traveling um, parallel to the bike trail to get access, and then traveling parallel to 91. Right. And the loading docks are parallel to 91. There's two sets of loading docks. Um, I could go back to the the drawing, but. Um, the, the reason why I was saying the, the length of travel is shorter be, is because um, 
the trailer parking area, the existing one, is located on the uh, on the northwest side of the facility, and the, the trucks have to drive, you know, an additional distance to get to that trailer parking area. With it being on the back side of the the building, they have to travel just a shorter distance to get there because all truck traffic goes around the rear of the facility, around to the uh, the second loading dock area. And the second loading dock is located where exactly? That is uh, approximately in the area of the new treatment building that we were looking at on the drawing. So trucks drive uh, counterclockwise around oh, the so facility. they're going to go counterclockwise. That is how they currently go. And, and now instead of having to drive from yeah. the from 6 o'clock you know, yeah. to 12 right. o'clock yeah, and I, back. I understand yeah. counterclockwise. Okay. Um, but tell me how that's going to shorten it. I, I still, I'm sorry, I apologize. I well, in, in general, the distance is so minimal that it, it really doesn't matter, I guess, as far as the distance of travel. The, the trucks, you know, maybe have to travel a few hundred feet less than, to get to the new trailer parking area versus the existing. So from a big picture standpoint, there's really very minimal, you know, change in distance that the trucks have to go. It is a little bit less, but it's only a couple hundred feet. Okay, thanks. Yes. Thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from the public? No? Questions from the board? I've got a curiosity question. Why would you slant the roof towards the tanks? Because in the winter, that will just pile up. It doesn't matter a hoot to me as far as your, your project, but it just looked funny. Well, um... The, uh, the front of the building <clears throat> that's on the opposite side of the tank has overhead doors so that we can get uh, equipment in, into the building. Okay, that's and, an answer. And uh, the slope had to be in one direction or the other, and that made the most sense. We have gutters on the tank side that convey stormwater uh, into the stormwater you know, system. Yeah, I was thinking about a couple of feet of snow, but thank you. Mm -hmm. that, that explains it. Yeah. Second. 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 All in favor? Okay, public comment uh, period is over. Any discussion? I mean, the biggest thing for me was uh, DPW, but they're fine with it. It's not most attractive. <coughs> it doesn't really need to be in that. It's, it's a functional building. Thank you. Um, well, and it changes their ground cover only a fraction mm -hmm. because the campus, the campus yeah. is so big. Right. And you can see they, they added a couple slivers of, of green space around the, the tank to make up for mm -hmm. where they parked just for that reason. So. so it seems pretty straightforward to me. Any other comments from anyone? No? Well, no. I move that we accept the site plan for treatment system of Coca-Cola. Uh, 45 Industrial Drive, Northampton, map ID 25A-185. Second. Second. All in favor? Approved. All right, thank you. Thank you. Such a narrow. Well, I see I give her my minute plans? up for other. Sure. <laughs> other. Um, we've got one set of minutes from the from April 11th. Somebody want to make a motion on those? Where did Devin go? That's exactly what I was going to do. Yeah. Oh, that's what I was thinking, too. Yeah. Uh, can I get a motion to approve the minutes from April 11th? I move we approve the minutes from April 11th. Second. Second hand. All in favor? There we go. So that's it for the formal items on the docket. Uh, we've got some general discussion about possible 
changes in housing above industrial and other possible changes for central business, and that's why you're here. Fearless other, leader. Other as well. As other, okay. So what do we got? So the first one is under the other category. Um, we're applying for Brownfields grants to look at the from um, Holyoke Street down to Northampton Dyke. So um, uh, Route 5, Pleasant Street, is a, is a state-owned road. The city's been talking about taking over that road for 15 years now. You all, your predecessors, were involved in that conversation. And one of the reasons for taking it over is as a state highway, there's no parking on it, and so cars drive up very fast, get to the bike path, they're still going very fast. If we take it over as a city road, we can put on-street parking on the street, we can calm the road. There's a spot at the intersection of Hockman Road and Pleasant Street, which is sort of a grass strip that's part of the state layout. We've talked about being a gateway park, basically sort of thinking that becomes the beginning of downtown. Um, our next step before Mass DOT is happy to give the road to the city, mm -hmm. our next step is to do our due diligence in terms of environmental issues. We've done a little bit when we looked at the historic Mill River. We found some manufactured gas plant waste. You know, they, 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 the round building right over here took gas, heated it up, I took coal, heated it up, basically made coke, and then the byproduct, the liquid, they just dumped out. Um, and that appears to be some of that on Pleasant Street. Um, and then the old Saab service station, which is now Pleasant Journey, had some gas leaks, of which there's been a lot of cleanup, but again, some that's gone into the road. So before we take over the road, we want to make sure that we're not, we don't know what we're getting. Was that um, part of that, you remember the couple years ago, the state came and cleared that park, redid the park at the end of Holyoke? Uh, oh, no, Hockenham. Yes. Was that, because there's, there's those, yeah. you know, the candy cane shade events? Yeah. yeah. Was that part of that? I don't know what that was from. I don't know the answer. Um, they have what's called down, it's a weird legal issue we're trying to understand. If somebody dumps stuff onto your property, there's a leaking oil tank up gradient. It's bad, and you can't necessarily use your property, but you have what's called downgrading property status. You're not responsible for somebody else's waste. The issue is that the city takes over that site. <clears throat> if the waste really came from over here, we own the property, and so we may not be eligible for downgrading property status. And so that's one of the things we're trying to understand. But I think those are probably from the Bay State cleanup. Didn't they have to do monitoring? Down the no, because Bay State said it wasn't theirs. Bay State said their stuff didn't go nearly that far. Okay. So um, so yeah, there's two like monitoring wells there. right yeah, at the yeah. corner. I thought the state did though. Yeah, because I, I just assumed they did. Yeah. yeah, I don't know the answer. You could be right. Yeah. Um, so if the, oh, sorry. if 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 we know of a potential issue under the road, but we don't know the extent of the issue, and then. We, we take over possession of the road from the state and find out that the extent is far greater than, right. than that, anyone thought. Right. That's why this process is so important. Right, so how, but how do you determine that if everything's underground without, how, how do you make a best they, guess? They would do drilling well. They drill okay. down and okay. sample and figure out what's The that. state. Well, we're applying for grants. So um, uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission got a, a grant from the EPA um, to do brownfields projects throughout the region, and they're in essence doing sub-recipients. So they have, I'm at, I've got the number, two or $300,000. And so they're looking for five or six projects. And so we're applying to be one of those projects. It's similar to what was done down here. To, right, to right. To draw and do tests. Right, right. Yeah. So we, got a, we, we had one of these pilots ourselves and looked at the whole Mill River, which is where we, why we've identified some of the waste that's there. But we didn't look at Pleasant Street in a direct way. So there's a bunch of studies done already. We looked at the whole Mill River. That's why we know it's there. And then um, we helped a Pleasant Journey get a grant to clean up the, the, their site. So we know a lot of what's there. This is really just filling some of the gaps. In our how, how far is it from the uh, fighting tributary of Mill River, the former Mill River, that if, if this were to be water, you know, restored? Um, it ends up down next to that, doesn't it? From here to Pleasant Street? Yeah, yeah I mean, basically it, it crosses Pleasant Street. So it's, it's in a pipe where it goes underneath, I think it's still the visiting nurse building. That's in a pipe. And then as soon as you get on the east side of Pleasant Street, the pipe comes out and you see the river again. Oh. It's not the cleanest river around, but it is there. <laughs> you need to talk about uncovering the Mill River? Is that what you're... Yeah. You're talking about that, yeah. 
That's what I call the walk tributary. Oh. <laughs> and does this have anything to do with the timing of the roundabout? Yes. So um, the, uh, the the things we ask Mass DOT to deliver before we take over the property is design and build the roundabout, um, and make sure the site's clean. So so we've talked about taking phases from from Holyoke to Hockman. We're not that worried about. Mm. So that we probably take over immediately. From Hockerman to Cons, we'd only take over if we did the brownfield assessment and found out it's clean. And then from Hockerman, uh, from um, Cons to Dyke, we take over once the roundabout is in place. The, well, how far did the Dyke pass the bowling alley? Dyke just yeah, the just right, right after. It's a it. southerly boundary. Right. Oh. At exactly. that point, Pleasant Street ends and becomes Mount Tom. Oh. So we're talking going up the end of Pleasant Street. So I'm just looking. Did, oh, sorry. I was just say, and and how did it collect? And did this the state present last night, or was it? Present last night. I wasn't there, but as far, so I don't know the details. Big picture, it's fine. I don't know if any of you butters any concerns about. You know, the only thing I'd heard in the past was the slip lane, which the state agreed to drop. So it's now like no one park, it's one lane, and then one of the butters was concerned about the sidewalk because they'd have to clear it in the winter. And I wasn't there last night, so I don't know if anything came up. Or um, I was there, and, and uh, we gave them attaboys for dropping the slip lane. Um, there was a question about possibly extending the sidewalk all the way to and through the dike, and if that was possible. Uh, Ned said that it, it had him scratching his head because he needed to have the, you know, the hardware for the for the blocking, whatever that contraption's called. Um, so, so he was going to he was going to look at that. Um, and there was uh, concern about pedestrians crossing. Um, you know, the uh, it's a it's it's a Y essentially, and that that's a faster roundabout than if you had a f the the four or five entries into a circle because the angles are less acute. Mm -hmm. But I thought it went r rather well. They they all left rather quickly. Were there many people there in the public? Uh, there were half a dozen. And nobody objecting to it, though? No, and uh, Mike Sullivan, uh, who's on our bicycle committee, um, had collected uh, opinions from South Street, which is one of the neighborhoods that sort of abuts it. Um, and he had turned over a list of supporters. So has Pleasant Journey cleaned up their site, but just outside their site, we think there's? Um, Pleasant Journey has completely cleaned up their site. They're mostly there. They still exceed cleanup levels in a couple of categories. Um, it doesn't help that we keep it in their cars. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what do you want to vote? A vote to support the Brownfields grant application and ask Mark to sign a letter. Do we need a formal, a formal vote or a formal I move okay. we Favor. <laughs> we want the next thing. Yes. So next thing is the central business district. So um, we had a focus group two days ago now, um, where we invited architects and downtown investors in to help us think about central business district and where the, you know what were the opportunities to encourage people to build buildings in the central business district. This is partially about thinking about Amtrak coming back, partially about thinking about, you know, where's the right place for development. You guys have clearly supported downtown in the past. Um, I think you know the city council just increased the amount of height limit in downtown by five feet. This is now the next side of asking developers what does it actually take to get buildings built there. You're smiling. Well, it's just one of the zoning things we've worked on for three oh, years. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I'm glad he passed. Um, so one of the things that, that we, we, we engaged the people at the focus group on was the discussion about um, first floor uses in central business. We had a requirement on our books for 30 years, and I think it's been a wonderful requirement, so, uh, about saying the first floor of a, business, of a building in central business, we want to be vibrant, so we don't want housing on the first floor. Above the first floor, we allow anything. First floor, we, we don't want it. Um, and I think it makes perfect sense from the standpoint of a building fronting on any street downtown, Pleasant Street, Main Street. You wouldn't want to have a dead facade. The issue is that we've really doubled the size of the central business district in the last decade. And some of the places in central business district aren't places which are ever going to be retail or restaurants. 
So you think, for example, about the roundhouse parking lot. One of the things we did 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, is rezone the area on the south side of the roundhouse parking lot to be central business district. Thinking this is great, we have a parking lot with surplus capacity. It's the one lot that has some healthy vacancy rates. That would be a great place for development. That would be a place where you could get dense housing in a way that people could walk downtown. Maybe you'd get some offices, but there's no way you'd ever get retail or restaurants there. Um, and so one thing we were playing with sort of two different approaches. One is sort of a central business light of an area around downtown that had exactly the same zoning as downtown, but you wouldn't require the first floor to be commercial. The other approach, which I think we got more excited about in this focus group, is thinking about really defining a downtown, say, any building that, that fronts on a street needs to be commercial on the first floor. But the portion of the building which doesn't front on the street or any building that's, you know, in a back lot wouldn't necessarily need to have commercial on the first floor. So I, I give you an example. 96 Pleasant Street, is that the right address? I keep paying right. So 96 Pleasant Street was an old SRO building, private sector SRO. And then it was bought by HAP, um, and they redeveloped it for, you know, it wasn't called enhanced SROs, ni nicer units. And one of the things that we said at the time as a condition of getting community development block grant is that we wanted the, the facade facing the street to be commercial because we didn't want it to be a dead spot. And so there used to be a bead shop there. I forgot who else is in there. But it's, a, you know, it's sort of right where Hampton Avenue hits Pleasant Street, the building across the street. One of the things that, that HAP said is, well, the problem is they need to have some handicap accessible units, um, and they don't want to put an elevator in the entire building. So we worked out to get the build, because it was a pre-existing non-conforming, we had more flexibility. We said, fine, we want the facade facing the street to have commercial, and they have two storefronts. But the rear of the building, we don't care if there's an apartment. It's hidden. It doesn't make the street dead. And so that's what that building ended up having. There's two, I think two, one, two handicap accessible units, but then the rear of the building. And, and I think in some ways that works really well. On Pleasant Street, it seems it's vibrant, it's alive, but we still let some housing there. Well, there's also the, that <clears throat> housing complex, as you're going down the bike path here on the right, um, that's, I don't know how many units are back there, but those are townhouse style apartments. When were those built? Those Were those built before? Those were built before. Oh, so they've just been there before yeah. that became an effect. Right. Right. They were rehabbed in 1985, um, okay. but they were the same units, the same more. pattern, right? right. Well, that's well, another good example of how that wouldn't affect, negatively affect the street life for those units at the back. At and, the back. The yeah. front, though, I mean, right. if that was a new project, I would say those units we would have wanted to be commercial up to the street, yeah. right. but the back we wouldn't. Right. Um, but again, if you think about a new building on that side of the parking lot, if you think about... Um, well, the house that Sejali built behind uh, the uh, old fire station, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. technically legal because the first floor is, a, um, office. is an office, right? Mm -hmm. But practically, no, it doesn't, doesn't feel any more alive to the street than it was all a single family home, mm -hmm. but I think that's okay. I mean, that, in fact, having a house there added vibrancy, it used to be a parking lot. So it's sort of thinking would those kinds of things work? Um, I forgot if um, the apartment beyond the toy store, does he go down to the first floor? No. Okay. But, you know, that kind of thing. You can imagine sort of the rears of buildings where you face a parking lot. Um, I, I think it could work without compromising the overall goal we're getting. Um, because, frankly, the, the area that's easiest, probably most attractive for new development downtown is additional housing. And we could certainly use it. I mean, you know, we, we always talk about if people are, buy, are if there's less retail downtown, that's been the 30-year trend. And if people are spending less money now because of the recession, um, you know, we might need a little more vibrancy, you know, a little more critical mass for downtown to remain vibrant. And so getting more housing would be a really good thing downtown. So we sort of wanted to explore. We haven't written any code. We'd obviously come back with you for proposed code. We wanted to sort of explore it with you after the focus group and see what your thoughts were about that. I, I, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, I, th I think the, the logic where first floor facing the street needs to be commercial. I don't know if I agree with back here where like a restaurant certainly wouldn't work or but because that to me you have parking you've got it's accessibility it seems like something could work over there but it's 
to me that's behind you know it's behind the main streets anyway so it's that's a different argument I don't know how you'd separate the two without getting too wordy uh, other than just say if you face the street you're commercial if you're behind you're you're good I mean that makes sense to me yeah I, I also disagree that that could never become successful in the restaurant or even retail district if if the center Northampton grew so a perfectly reasonable place to have something that's not housing I think a lot of the resistance to, to extra to housing or converting commercial space to housing came from Terry Anderson who jealously guarded anything that uh, could possibly be industrial I don't know if that extended to regular commercial places or not uh, but I've always been a strong advocate of, of putting housing in places um, uh, for instance, the State Street Fruit Store, if they wanted to go up the second floor, uh, that would be a good place for housing. Uh, across the street from State Street, that, that's now part of the central business, isn't it? Yeah. And are there, there are people still living there that are on the first floor? Again, grandfathered, though. They, they could yeah. do that for some uses. Yeah. I think a lot of them have converted there to real estate or lawyers' yeah. offices. Yeah. So. How far down State Street does it go? Uh, I think it goes up to Bedford. Yeah, to the, so the bread shop is the last. That's the last. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was interesting that in the um, in our group and the group I was in actually there was universal support for the concept of street front and sidewalk front commercial, and that that was a very crucial component to the zoning, um, and then also support for uh, residential though off the street where it's not um, as um, critical to maintaining that vibrancy. It's certainly true in Florence, downtown Florence. I guess it depends. Part of it's going to depend on how you define off the streets. So that's how it's so just State yeah. Street. Think of State Street. There's a parking lot facing the street. So does that mean at the back of that parking lot where the dumpster State Street has their dumpsters? Does that would that be far enough off the street that you could put first floor residential, or would that? I mean, how do you define off the street? I would think you might literally do fa the side that's facing the street. So the dumpsters that are facing towards Center Street right. probably should still be housing. But the part that's facing... The res commercial. It's just a commercial, I'm sorry. Right. Right. But the part that's facing the parking lot that doesn't right. face it. Yeah. Well, there's the other issue, too. You have a build two line. So you, you couldn't... You're not supposed to build in the back of, the, of a parking lot. So anything new would have to be on the street. So if you build two buildings, right. that, you know... That oh, you couldn't put a parking lot you couldn't put it like take half that parking lot and put a building at the back of it no because the zoning says you need to build at the front at the sidewalk and put the parking behind. oh okay yeah but ironically there used to be houses along there but where the red house is the yes yeah, sure. the cut through and they had an extra story added to it mm -hmm. there were a row of houses sure. that went over to center street there was a street there well there used to be where the parking lot and the parking garage are now or the, where, before the parking garage weren't there houses back there no, that was a big parking lot. I mean, in my memory, anyway. I some houses came down. There was a gigantic tree in the middle of it. I mean. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, it sounds, I, I think this would be another, like, how do you define it? I mean, it's on the bike path. It's on a parking lot. There's successful first floor businesses just across the way where, um, I'm not sure what they're, what they're called. They're not so successful first floor businesses. Oh, they're not successful. Oh, the Maple, yeah. No, they find, they, they find tenants, but they're, they have pretty high vacancies, pretty right. low yeah. rent, and a lot of, they've started switching more to offices mm. because they're having a hard time attracting mm. businesses. Um, and, and, and all this would be permissive. This wouldn't say, you know, using this one as an example, this wouldn't say you couldn't do a restaurant there. It would just say we're not requiring. You don't have to. Mm. If you find the market works for you, that's great. But, um, right. All right, so we're doing the first draft of the language and come back to you, and then you can look at the details for that. Yeah. Um, I mean, it seems like if it's this back here, just to keep coming back here, it seems too accessible to be called off street, you know, or off. It, it, it's in the back of, you know, Main Street, but it's, but it's accessible from different angles. It just seems um, versus, like, the State Street, where you can, it's, right. I think, more easily defined. So I don't know how you would, you would write that, but... It, it seems logical okay. which way you're headed. I mean, did you have much pushback at all from any downtown owners or developers? No. I mean, I think it, Carolyn's right. It certainly got that on the streets, 
we clearly want commercial. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, facing it. Right. Um, and elsewhere, they thought it made sense. They didn't. We didn't get in the weeds enough to address some of the things that you're raising. You know, exactly what does this mean? I mean, one one um, another example would be you, you know Northampton Lumber is on the market, and that front building, um, you know, could be renovated to really have a street presence, which it doesn't have now. But there's that that lot is deep. I mean, it goes back. So does it make sense to sort of bulk up on the indust- on the residential on the back side, but not have that? Restriction to have ground floor commercial in the back where they now have the lumber store. Right, that's a good example. Yeah, yeah and they've got all the lumber they need right there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, they have parking and a lot of space back yeah. there. You could put up a lot of houses back yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you could say, I, I, mean, I certainly support, so you should go ahead with that. So then the second thing, and I really will be done. Um, <laughs> the second thing is actually more what Franny was talking about. This is about the industrial districts. So when our office industrial districts, um, we allow housing right now only if it's live workspace. Um, and the housing unit has to be above the first floor. And the question is, does it make sense to liberalize that to allow housing? We cert- same thing, we certainly wouldn't want it on the first floor because we don't have a lot of industrial space in town, office space, and so we want to keep the first floor. The issue with the upper stories is um, you can see the argument for not allowing housing because we're worried about housing competing with offices and then losing the offices. But the benefit for allowing them is it's one of the best ways to allow multi-story buildings. We know in the market, people building medical offices are often building one or two-story mm-hmm. buildings. And both we want to retain the old brick buildings um, or attract people building new multi-story buildings, giving flexibility might be desirable. I, I think from my standpoint, there's no reason, there's no question my thinking is partially affected by how successful East Hampton's been at the Eastworks building and now the building to the left of Eastworks. We're not not suggesting the retail part, but in the building they allow offices and they allow retail again, which I think would work for us, and they allow housing and they let the market determine which comes There's in. There's residential in Eastworks? Yeah. Oh absolutely. Yes, yeah, I'm spectacular really lofts with you. Oh I thought it was all oh, no, commercial yeah. retail. I think just one floor, the top floor. Uh, and then the new building to the left of it, the new yeah. rehab. I haven't been in the new one, but I gather some housing there as well. Um, and that's what probably uh, what I feel should have been done in arts and industry building. Right. And also the building, um, well, where Tapestry Health's uh, regional headquarters is now in Nonatuck. That the old pro brush maybe. Yeah. I don't know. That easily could be residential up there. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, and that was one of the things that uh, Terry fought tooth and nail. We, we do allow live work, which, um, but that requires you to, you know, have a space in the building. So right. yeah, it's I don't different know what difference it makes. Really, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say I think the objection from um, people wanting to maintain um, economic development interests would be. A concern that new residents then would push out the industry that's been there for a long time because of complaints of noise or something. That's the question. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that's always, you know, a fine line or a, a, a concern. But it is, I mean, it is a question. It's an issue. I, I think in some ways, people who build in big loft buildings may sort of be more understanding of what they're buying in for. It's different if you. You know, you own a single family home, and right next door to you, there's a, a noisy business somewhere. Um, it wasn't there last year. It wasn't right. there. Right. <laughs> but if you're buying into a mixed building where the only thing allowed on the first floor is industrial, then I think there's less of that piece. Did you guys talk about a percentage of the building? Like only half could be used as residential? Or? No, we've been thinking it's above the first floor. And just anything above the first above floor? Above the first floor, right. One of the practical problems is arts industry is a good example. The amount of code stuff necessary for that sort of building probably makes it all but impossible. Yeah, so you're probably, by definition, talking about smaller buildings. And for a smaller building, the percentage might not work that well. Because you might get one building that's 40,000 square feet, and maybe that building is 30,000 square feet of offices, of housing, and then 10,000, mm-hmm. and another building that just doesn't work at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, obviously, if we found a trend and thought we were losing all these, we could stop. But getting some more housing, I think, in those would be a good way to do it. You know, there's you know there's discussion of U R A B and C. There's always pushback for more density in neighborhoods. This is sort of an easier way to get density without that sort of pushback because these are places where everybody wants that vibrant city. There. How about uh, Florence Grammar? How would that work? 
So Florence Grammar, well, it's allowed anyway because it's a historical building. So that zoning that says if you're reusing a historical um, institution or church, they could allow housing in that building. But let's say they didn't. So right now in the current zoning, even though it's office industrial, right. if they put a historic preservation restriction, they could have housing in that building. That's in essence what Opal's doing at, at Clark. Right, right. Um, but if it wasn't a historical building or they didn't want to do something, then yes, it would allow them to do housing in that building. Yeah, well, that, that's, I mean, an ideal example. Of, uh, yeah. That's exciting. Right, so you guys are comfortable with this one? Yeah. All right, so we draft language and come back to you at whatever your next meeting is. You're not busy, but. Yeah. Okay. All right, that's all I got. Can we get Bay Bank to put a second, third, fourth story on their building? Yeah. The, the old Newberry building? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> that'd be nice to be three, four stories. The SIS building or whatever. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 that should be, yeah. yeah. I know. And the CVS. Well, yeah, right. Same thing, right. Same thing. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, well, the Kresge's, you know, it's all yeah. the same. Well, <laughs> You're dating <what>? yourself. <laughs> Goggins is looking to redo the Bank of America building and then put residential behind that. Would this, that would be allowed now, wouldn't it? So right now for his building, his first floor has to be offices. Yeah. So that's what he was planning. It's but if off. this change happened, then potentially, I, I think he wants his office there anyway, but if this change happened, yeah, potentially that building could have been all housing. The back building. The back building, mm -hmm. right, not the front building. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should stop the project. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to tell you, I mean, the offices are great when we can attract them. I just, yeah. you know. You can, always, you can always convert it later. That's true. Back of the owner. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, just so you know, in terms of dates, um, we have uh, a hearing May 9th, and then the joint public hearing with Ordinance Committee May 13th on the residential changes. So we just put the legal notice in, um, it'll go in Monday's paper, actually, um, 7 o'clock. Um, That's the one Mark can't make. That's right. Uh, <laughs> um, and then potentially, I guess May 23rd is the next meeting date. So I don't have anything yet for that, but those are the sort of the meetings in May. Yuck. <laughs> That's your last meeting, right? You need to have something. Oh, yeah. Well, we we'll can create something. something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll make something. Right. <laughs> That's it? Yep. Move to adjourn. Second. Favor? Meeting adjourned.